Mariana, thank you to the Foundation for inviting me back. Um, as Rival mentioned, um, I have been here uh, over a course of many years and at the first Integration Foundation meeting I went to, uh, I looked up above the stage and the great big sign said, Non-Estonian Integration Foundation. And I asked the organizers, uh, what is the name of this organization? Is integration only for the nons or is it for everybody? And as you'll see, my answer is that it's for everybody trying to live together in a diverse plural society. And that's, of course, the title of my talk. The same title I used in a publication of the Integration Foundation in 2003. And I chose to ask the same question in the title because I think the issues are still with us. And although there has been some progress, uh, <clears throat> certainly the issues of how to live together as culturally different peoples in the same society have not been uh, answered by any means. Uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to share with you is uh, from the point of view of the discipline of psychology, in particular the discipline of intercultural psychology, and that is how people who have been raised in different cultures with different identities and perhaps different sets of values can actually figure out how to live successfully together in the same, what I call the larger society, a shared civic framework within which we can all participate and all contribute. And I'm also going to rely on um, a research project, which I hope will not get too technical, that uh, has just been submitted to Cambridge University Press called Mutual Intercultural Relations. Uh, it's a study in 17 societies, including Estonia, Latvia, Russia, Finland, and so on. And I'm going to draw, I hope, some general principles that might go some way to answering the question, how can we live together when we have different cultural backgrounds? So, <clears throat> as a Canadian uh, in the country that um, as early as the 1950s promoted the idea that we cannot succeed as a society if we promote assimilation, but we have to try to accommodate everybody's uh, cultural interests and cultural goals within a shared framework. So multiculturalism, uh, from the point of view in Canada, is a shared personal and public good. It's a resource. It's an opportunity. It's uh, something that we should value and promote. Multiculturalism means more than promoting and accepting and enjoying cultural diversity. It also means opening up, removing barriers, seeking ways to encourage people and to allow people to participate in the framework of the larger society. These two in balance are both required because if we only have diversity without equitable participation, Ah, it's, so I need to click pointing over there. Can I help you? Um, yeah. I think, uh, just, just click it, uh, I think just click it on the door. Perhaps I could ask you to click it as I <laughs> adv advance this. <laughs> Because where is the point? It should go up there or over here to point? Here, yeah. Anywhere. It, it does go up here on this side, but not there. Yeah, you see? Just click. Oh. Okay, there is no, no connection between computer and... Uh, yeah. It works on this side, but... Uh, we had with the same so while they're working on this, uh, yeah. let me try to convince you that 
uh, in the absence of equal participation, cultural diversity can and does lead to segregation. And so from my point of view, when some European leaders say that multiculturalism has failed, my answer is that it hasn't failed because it was never really tried. It was seen primarily, even exclusively in some cases, in terms of the maintenance and the permission tolerance of cultural difference without opening up and providing opportunities for full and equal participation. So <clears throat> how can we understand multiculturalism and integration? Uh, Rivo said that I will tell you the truth. In fact, I'll only tell you my point of view. Um, and it's rooted in uh, a framework that uh, I've worked with for uh, the last 45 years. Uh, it began with research uh, with Aboriginal communities in Australia and subsequently in many other parts of the world. And <clears throat> the research address addresses these two questions. When individuals are asked how they want to live, they really fundamentally have to deal with two questions. One is, to what extent do I value my heritage culture, my cultural identity? And some people say yes, very much. Some people say no, not at all. And the second issue, which I hope is shown up there, is to what extent do I want to participate in the life of the larger society as a member of my cultural community? So these are the two issues that frame multiculturalism definition that I've just gone through, but it's also the root of uh, much of the research I'm going to talk about. When we take those two dimensions, two questions, and allow them to cross each other, intersect, and when we ask the questions for the non-dominant ethnocultural groups shown on the left, and when we ask the questions with respect to the views of people in the larger society, whether it's national policy or public attitudes, we end up with terms that you are familiar with, but I'm showing them here because they have, in my framework, very precise definitions. So when, on the left side, when people of non-dominant communities don't value and want to maintain their heritage, culture, and identity, but at the same time want to be fully participating in the life of the larger society. This is what we know as assimilation. And on the right-hand side, when those questions are posed to the dominant group, public policy, public attitudes, the answer, no, we don't want them to keep their cultures and identities. We want them instead to become full participants and essentially be melted into the pot. So these are two terms that you're familiar with. The uh, opposite, if you can have an opposite in circles, um, on the left-hand side, when people strongly value their heritage identity and want to keep their cultures alive over generations, and they prefer to do it, according to the second dimension, by having very little contact or participation. This is what, of course, is known as a separation strategy, and it's, of course, also a collective strategy with respect to Scottish Quebecois or other form, Basque forms of separation. And on the right-hand side, uh, it reveals itself in a form of segregation. That is, it's okay to keep your cultures diff cultural differences, but don't get us involved. Don't bother us. And increasingly, research in Western Europe, particularly in the Netherlands, has come up with this as the most common view of members of the larger societies. Yeah, we'll tolerate it, but please don't expect us to, to be bothered by it. Just keep it to yourself. It's a form of segregation, and that is, I think, what has essentially been uh, the meaning of multiculturalism in many Western European societies. Again, going to the left-hand side, marginalization is when you're out of both, you're caught in between, you don't know who you are. And as we heard this morning, this is probably the pool of people from whom we derive those willing to be radicalized. And on the right-hand side, it's known essentially as exclusion. We don't like your culture, and in any case, we don't want you around. Please go. The upper left-hand part of both circles, integration, in my view, is when people seek to maintain themselves culturally through their lifetimes and over generations, 
and want to do so by being a full participant in the larger society. They are doubly engaged. They have both bonding capital within their own community and bridging capital to the larger society. And on the right-hand side, you'll find that the counterpart term there is multiculturalism, and these are the two elements of the uh, Canadian policy, and I think are both, as I said, essential for uh, survival in culturally plural societies. So how did we um, come to do research on these issues? Well, uh, in Canada, every 10 years, social public policies have to be evaluated. And over the years, I've been asked to do that for the multiculturalism policy. And uh, I came up with um, a framework, another framework, that essentially identifies what are the components of the policies and how they are supposed to work together. And there are three uh, components um, set to direct progress towards a common goal, and that is mutual acceptance, mutual appreciation, and uh, more harmony, uh, less conflict in the larger society. The three components there we call the cultural component, the social component, and the communications component. So in this framework, the upper right-hand side is the goal of a multiculturalism policy, and I think it's valid for many societies. How can we improve our relationships trying to live together as culturally different peoples? The cultural component is the upper left, and this is viewing cultural diversity as a public good, as a personal good. It's a resource for society to have diversity. Societies that have less diversity have fewer responses to challenges. More diverse work groups are more creative and uh, have more opportunities to deal with issues. The lower left is the social or intercultural component, and this is the idea that cultures are valuable in their own right, but they're even more valuable when they're shared, and people of different cultures can socially interact and participate. So the upper left and the lower left are these two components again. And of course, you can't have participation and sharing unless you share some way of communicating. So at least in the Canadian framework, we decided that it wasn't possible to run our society unless the 25% of the population whose mother tongue was French could find a place in the society as a whole, not just in their own part of the country. And so we opted for official bilingualism. It's not an option that uh, everybody appreciates in every country, but it's the way we sought to solve the issue. So with these components, these are program components that are funded there are links between them. So across the top is what we call the multiculturalism principle. It's contained in a statement in the policy, the 1971 policy, that says only when people are secure, and here's that word again, only when people are psychologically secure in who they are, when they're confident, will they be in a position psychologically to accept those people who are different from themselves. You reverse that. If you question their right to be who culturally who they are and want to be, if you discriminate against them, if you say you don't belong, if you dress or act like that, then the reverse will happen. They will engage in the development of negative attitudes towards those who question their right to be culturally different in the society. So the multiculturalism principle, again, raises this issue of security. But here we're talking about the perception of personal economic, and cultural security. I am not under threat in being X or Y or Z in this society. I am accepted to be that way. <clears throat> the lower left, uh, compared to the upper right, that's the integration principle. It says that people achieve greater well-being, including, including greater uh, mutual acceptance, when they are doubly engaged in their own culture and participants in the larger society. We know from all sorts of psychological research that the more identities people have, the more networks they have, the more social connections they have, the higher is their level of psychological and social well-being. And this is a prerequisite as well for accepting people who are different from yourself. 
So down the left-hand side is this integration principle. And from the lower left to the upper right, we have something that's probably better known to many of you, and that's the contact hypothesis. That when the lower left, the social interactions and participation uh, proceed, particularly under conditions when they're voluntary rather than coerced, and when there is a normative framework, such as <coughs> excuse me, laws and rules that say people should have an opportunity to engage each other through intercultural contact, then the prediction going from lower left to upper right is that on average, and in the long run, not immediately, people will develop mutually positive attitudes. And this isn't just true for ethnicity. It's young people's attitudes to old, uh, able-bodied people attitudes to disabled, uh, straight people's attitudes towards gays and lesbians. It's been shown over and over again. So what is the validity of these three principles? And can we find that they hold in many societies which are dealing with the issue of diversity in their populations? And that's the point of the project that, uh, as I said, I've just completed. So I've given you a verbal explanation of these next slides. So just to review, if you want to have a quick look, multiculturalism hypothesis or principle, when you feel secure, when your identity and culture is not threatened, when you're not discriminated against, if you're, when you're not told that you can't be like that, then you are in a position to accept those who are different. When you are told all of those things, you will distance yourself psychologically and hold negative attitudes. In a sense, it's a form of reciprocity. You don't like me the way I am? I don't like you. I'm going to distance myself from you. Integration, when you're doubly engaged or multiply engaged, when you have more than one identity, more than one social network, more than cult one cultural milieu in which you feel comfortable, you will achieve greater levels of psychological and social well-being. And the contact hypothesis, just to review it, the more opportunities you have to voluntarily engage in intercultural contact, the more likely it is you will end up with mutual respect. The communications component um, is more contentious, particularly here. Um, I notice there's no Russian translation today. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, it's something that I'm not going to mention again. <laughs> it's, up for, it's up to you. So. The mutual intercultural relations in plural society, the MIRAPS project, has indeed uh, assessed the validity, looked at whether we can evaluate whether these three principles are supported uh, through research in 17 different societies. The idea is that if we can repeatedly ask these questions and repeatedly find similar answers, then they could possibly serve as a starting point for the development of multicultural policy, policy that will improve intercultural relations in many societies. Now, of course, nobody in their lifetime could study it in every society. So what we have are uh, a number of societies in which Russian peoples are involved. As you saw from the first slide, I've been a research professor at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow. From there, we've worked in the Caucasus, we've worked in Azerbaijan, not we, meaning the team, in Latvia, Estonia, and uh, with Russian populations in Finland and in Norway. And we've also worked with Hindu-Muslim relations in India, migrants from People's Republic of China into Hong Kong, um, migrants from Ecuador and Spain, uh, returnees from Portuguese territories in Portugal, uh, people coming from North Africa into Malta um, and uh, Tunisians coming into Sicily. So many different and diverse uh, environments. And the question is, do we find any patterns that can help us form a basis on which to proceed towards uh, greater uh, intercultural harmony? So in these, actually there are 17 different countries, there are 38 different possible evaluations. In each country, we had 
a sample of the dominant cultural community, the larger society, and at least one, sometimes more than one, sample of the non-dominant population. So this allowed us to examine the validity, the evaluate these ideas 38 times. So this is what we found. The three hypotheses are listed down the left-hand side. And across the top, we have national samples, the larger uh, communities, the dominant communities. Then the ethnic samples, the non-dominant ethnocultural groups. And then a total. And what I've put in, in a very simplistic way, is where we find support, I've put a plus sign. Where we find ambiguous or not complete support or no relationship, I've put a zero across the top. And where we have the opposite to what was predicted, significantly opposite, we have a negative sign. You can see there that, by and large, there is far more support for these hypotheses across this large variation in cultural and national settings than there is either no support or contrary support. And so one of the conclusions that I have drawn in uh, the book is that this is probably a good place to start or start over again, in the case of some societies, to consider what is the best way forward, how can we answer this question, how shall we all uh, live together. The study specifically in Estonia, um, as well as some of the other societies in which there are Russian-speaking populations, stand out more for either having no or contrary support than all of the other samples. And I won't go through the results uh, in these societies or specifically in Estonia in detail, but I think that the polarization, the historical memories, and the difficulties of having to transform oneself from a dominant community, even if not numerically or demographically, to transform oneself from a dominant position into being just another minority group has caused all sorts of psychological difficulties. However, I think that given the widespread support for these three principles internationally means that it may be a matter of time, it may be a matter of sorting out relationships, and then proceeding more strongly towards this idea that integration is a two-way street, it's mutual accommodation, it isn't dragging one group into the other. Either way, it is finding ways of accommodating each other and creating a larger society, a common civic framework that represents everybody just because some people got here earlier, a few thousand years ago, or a few hundred years ago, doesn't mean that they can continue to control the society forever and ever. Societies and cultures are constantly evolving, and evolving in the direction of mutual accommodation and greater harmony is surely a goal that we all share. So digging in heels and telling people they can't be that way almost certainly creates what we call reactive identity. You can't be like this. What's my response? I'm going to be more like that. So you react and it's counterproductive. So finding routes to mutual accommodation through these three principles, which I think are valid, is probably the best starting point moving forward. So I'll end there, and I'll be happy to engage in discussion uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>